Today is the 1st of August, the year 2022. It is a day of sadness, a day that is turning, uh, starting out to be gloomy, but largely because the nation has lost a great leader, a great man, none other than former President Fidel Valdez Ramos. We in Agenda and Signal TV send our condolences to the family and we pray that in this time of great loss, the Lord will comfort you and console you. As for everyone else, good day. This is Agenda. Thank you for joining us today. And as expected, part of the program will be spent remembering FBR uh, through the eyes of someone who worked closely with him, both in and out of government. And uh, after that, we will also be addressing concerns of the riding motoring public regarding the problems brought about by non-contact uh, mm -hmm. arrests being implemented independently by local government units that have turned out to be uh, turned out to be a uh, cause for concern. Okay. Okay, and uh, we begin our day with our daily starter. One day, you'll be a memory for some people. Do your best to be a good one. And as I already mentioned, we remember today someone who has done more than that. Someone who has proven us, uh, uh, who has shown us that he has been a good and faithful servant uh, to the nation, to his family, and to the Lord. And he has shown us uh, that when you do your work well, people will remember you, will respect you, and hopefully will also love you. So our daily starter for today is done uh, remembering the work, the life of Fidel Valdez Ramos. And I repeat, uh, our daily starter, one day you'll be a memory for some people. Do your best to be a good one. And we thank FBR for giving us great memories and for being the good man that he was. Okay. And now let's go to the front page of the Philippine Star quickly. And as expected, the front page is a farewell. Fare thee well, FBR. Ramos, 94 years old, succumbs to COVID complications. We we use this headline to remind people that uh, if you have not had your booster shots, please uh, get your booster shots and be wary of COVID because that is what ultimately got Fidel Valdez Ramos, not the bullet, not the coup d'etat, but COVID-19. The top of the front page at the header, Pinoy in Singapore has monkeypox. And in a related story, children getting infected. Okay, just a cl clarification that it, those are two stories. Okay, some people might get confused. A Filipino has been uh, reported to have uh, monkeypox. He is in isolation in a Singapore health facility. And in uh, the West, people are watching, especially the World Health Organization, are closely watching monkeypox among children. It is a very small population, but they are very worried about this because children are the largest and fastest uh, spreaders of uh, different diseases. And that is why there is a watch of monkeypox over uh, on children. And, and in other stories, Closer coordination between palace and Congress being pushed after President Bongbong Marcos vetoed approximately five uh, proposed legislations and the Senate President Mick Zubiri has uh, called for the appointment of a uh, 
a coordinator, a, a liaison officer that understands the job and that is proactive because the senators uh, feel that if there was a legislative liaison officer who was proactive, none of these bills would have been vetoed and uh, such a waste of time could have been avoided. Okay. Meanwhile, the University of the Philippines in Diliman held its uh, in-person graduation rites for the first time after two years. Okay. And uh, quake injuries or those who were injured during the uh, recent uh, earthquake in Abra has risen to 375, 355 of them in the car region, Cordillera Autonomous Region, the rest in Cagayan and uh, Ilocos. Okay, Comelec postponement of Barangay and Sangguniang Kabataan Polls unconstitutional. That was the declaration of attorney, attorney Mak Makalintal claiming that the recent uh, attempts or calls of legislators to postpone the barangay and SK uh, elections is unconstitutional and should no longer be allowed. Last but not the least, we have the photo of uh, Man the Chairman Manny Pangilinan and President uh, of PLDT, uh, Alpan, Alpan Lilio, if I'm not mistaken, uh, medyo mali itong picture natin. <laughs> okay, so, essential na kayo. Alpan Lilio toasting the uh, launching the official power up of the US Trans Pacific Jupiter Cable System of PLDT. Okay, so those are the front page news of the Philippine Star today. Now let's get on with the first half of our program, which is a remembrance of FVR, President Fidel Valdez Ramos, and let's introduce our first guest to this video. Shelito Habito was the Socio-Economic Planning Secretary of the late former President Fidel V. Ramos. Habito currently teaches economics in the Ateneo de Manila University. Aside from this, Habito was a professor in Upilos Baños, his alma mater. He also used to work at Kyoto University in Japan and in World Bank. Good morning, Secretary Professor Habito. Uh, I do hope you are in the best of health and sorry for disrupting your sleep patterns. <laughs> Good morning, Sito, and good morning to our fellow Filipinos who are mourning today, I'm sure. Yes, uh, I, you know, uh, one observation I had was that for the first time in the longest time, uh, someone passed away and it was uh, all an expression of goodwill, of loss, of, uh, of salutation, and uh, wala, na, wala akong nakitang nega or you know any criticism whatsoever and 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 someone uh, I, in fact i remember someone uh, saying he's the only good present president we've had so far after uh, edsa uh, and so on and uh, what about you secretary abito you worked closely with the man uh, people have been sharing their memories and thoughts what about you well, indeed, uh, I, I've always described him to be my standard of good leadership and, you know, the foremost model of what the president of this country should be. You know, having worked up close with him, uh, you know, one of the things that I always say about what a good leader is, is that he or she must be able to bring out the best in the people that he leads. And President Ramos was certainly that. He, he, the, the, the way that he led by example with working days that start as early as 4 a.m. and going late into the night. You know, if you were working under him, whether as a cabinet member or, the, or, or any employee in the bureaucracy, you would actually be pushed to do your best and you know, give, him, give the most to our country because he was our 
team captain, our playing coach, who was actually uh, as immersed as everybody else was in this work of uh, improving the lot of our fellow Filipinos. So talagang very inspiring and we have lost a great, great man. Okay, having said that, uh, what were the more detailed observations or stories that you have? Because uh, uh, I noticed that uh, a lot of uh, people uh, in times like this, when someone passes away, that's the only time you hear the real stories, the, the real, you know, the anecdotes that matter. Well, you know, fortunately, I've been writing a column for 19, going on 20 years now, and in uh, several cases, I've had a chance to pay tribute to him. And so when I draw back to w- 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 all those things I've said about him, there are things that stand out that can be summed up in acronyms or letters. Mm-hmm. And I think the one that, uh, that usually comes up the most is CSW, Completed Staff Work, which when I researched it and I wrote about it, uh, realized, again, it was a military term. It, it, it has its origins in the military, which mm-hmm. understandable, again, because of his military background. He brought it to his presidency. And what that really means is that, you know, when subordinates submit something to the superior, in this case, the president himself, uh, it must already contain all the sides of an argument. And, it, you know, you don't make the president the decision maker uh, do any more work by giving him all of the facts, all of the arguments for and against, all the alternatives, and then make a recommendation. So all he would need to do is to sign it and to actually, uh, first of all, decide, uh, indeed, and affirm the recommended decision, mm-hmm. and then sign the document. And the, he was that demanding. Uh, it is not. It was not uncommon for us, his members of the cabinet, to be receiving back documents we had sent to him recommending a certain executive order, administrative order, whatever presidential issues. And it would come back with big red letters written with this trademark red flare pen, CSW. And of course, we would already know that's a rebuke that we hadn't done our homework enough. So uh, anyway, we would have to go back to work. And later on, he told us the way to prove that you have CSW is when you make a submission for a draft executive order or whatever, have the signatures of all the cabinet members who are affected or concerned in that transmittal document. That way I can be assured that you have done CSW. But that's how thorough he was. Uh, it, it's quite remarkable because you know, that, that really made coordination a must in government. And you know this is something that everybody often laments. So there's not enough, not even communication among mm-hmm. departments of government, much less coordination. But he demanded it, and that was because of his military background. So he, I think most of us would remember him most for those three letters of CSW. Now, the other letters yeah. I would uh, remember would be also three letters, UST, in the University of Santo Tomas. It's unity, solidarity, and teamwork. From the very, very first cabinet meeting, right after he took his oath in Luneta, Sinarmuna na kami about unity, solidarity, and teamwork. And why, why, bakit kayo na sermonan? What triggered that? You know, I think he was coming from the fact, and with all due respect to his predecessor, President Cory Aquino, uh, we had seen in the previous cabinet public debates among cabinet members over policy issues. So he was, he did not want a government wherein his cabinet members would be debating publicly, through the media especially. And so what he said was that if you are going to be looking at policy decisions, you have to first do your debates behind closed doors. But at the same time, uh, you, you have all to convince one another what the right course of action will be. And once a decision is made, whether by consensus or by majority, he had very strong words. If you don't agree, well, you either sh- sh- uh, shut up or ship out, I guess, military terms as well. No? Mm-hmm. But really, that was exactly what he demanded, that there was be unity, teamwork, solidarity. You know? So UST, Unity, Solidarity, Teamwork. And, and I, I loved his analogy of it. He said, we are all in one boat. And if we are rowing our oars in different directions, our boat will just keep turning around in circles. But if we are all rowing in the same direction, in teamwork and unity, then we could surge ahead and in fact, get ahead of our neighbors who at that time had all practically left us behind in many ways. 
Mm-hmm. Kaya talagang yung UST doctrine niya and CSW were foremost in my mind in remembering. As a- But, allow me to interject. Uh, okay, so the policy was publicly UST. But behind closed doors, uh, did he just sit and watch and you know observe cabinet members and officials uh, go at each other's throat? Kumbaga, sige, dito tayo, gladiator, uh, gladiator games tayo dito sa loob ng Malacanang. Uh, or did he demand the, you know, because you cited his military background. And in the military, there is this chain of command, this respect, and kumbaga, uh, junior officer ka, wag kang sasabat-sabat o sasagot-sagot sa, sa senior cabinet member. Well, he had a rather unusual way of making sure that a consensus would be reached as quickly as possible. You know, mm-hmm. there is a small room in Malacanang once you ascend up the stairs leading to the state dining room. When you make a left turn, there are small rooms there. And he would have us disagreeing cabinet members whenever there was such a debate on particular policy directions to meet there. And you know what? We didn't know it then. It was much later that he told us he deliberately told the palace guards to turn off the air conditioning in that room. <laughs> So he, he made it as uncomfortable as possible for us so that we will be forced to reach a consensus as quickly as possible because it was so uncomfortable being inside that room. And, and that was a, a device, a trick he used that he, you know, he, again, we did not know about this. But later on, when he told us all about that, and apparently, again, it's something he used in the military to realize the wisdom of this method of his unconventional but truly effective in getting his uh, cabinet members to agree through the okay. years through the years many of us have forgotten the fact that he was a saiwar uh, operative yes. uh, he indulged in uh, psychological warfare etc did you ever see this firsthand or know about it firsthand Well, you know, I, I, maybe I'm not so sure if you can call it Sai War, but one of the things I admired with him was in his, in his brand of statesmanship, he was also practicing brinksmanship. And I think it can be told now, for example, that, uh, that at, at the time that uh, we, there was a visit, a very, actually a very confidential visit from the Taiwan leader. Uh, of course, it was kept uh, very confidential, very secret. But it happened in Clark. One evening, several of us cabinet members had to go there. I think we had to go by chopper to make it quick because the Taiwanese president was coming in for a, for a dinner. Anyway, what I'm really alluding to here is the fact that look, he, was, he was there. We had uh, friendly relations with, uh, of course, with the mainland China. But he was on this uh, diplomatic uh, you know, initiative with Taiwan, which he knew was a no-no at the time with the bigger China. So in short, this was the kind of brinksmanship he was practicing to be able to keep good relations with other countries, especially again, our close neighbor. And so, you know, I, I, I've seen him do things like that, that would be uh, something one would normally not expect from a leader who would of course want to maintain very good diplomatic relations with everybody. But as I said, uh, you know, I think he was using this kind of a, of a card with uh, mainland China to be able to also get some kind of uh, you know, uh, pro- proper uh, decisions from the other one that will be uh, you know, uh, conditioned by the kind of leverage he was making. Okay, now uh, what, what, was, what was his uh, you know, dream? Because he, he had a lot of slogans. He had a newly industrialized country, kaya natin to, et cetera. But deep down, did, did he have a dream, you know, like, like Lee Kuan Yew had uh, or other regional presidents? Did he ever have a dream that, you know, ne- was never really spoken of? Well, again, I'm, I'm glad you bring that up because truly I think he is the only president that I have witnessed who, who really had a very clear vision for the country. And for the country, he, say, he would say it in so many words. At one time, I remember, uh, we were being uh, asked about what Philippines 2000 is all about. As you know, that was his trademark slogan mm. for the future of the country, for the direction the country was going into. It's somewhat inspired, by the way, by the phrase Japan Inc. No? 
So we had to have something to rally behind in terms of developing the Philippines and it became Philippines 2000. And so he would say things like, you know, we have to make sure that when our fellow Filipinos turn on their faucets, there will always be water coming out. When they make, uh, when they try to make a telephone call and first when they apply for a telephone, they must be able to get a telephone. And that was a time as we may recall, when uh, there was a joke that 98% of Filipinos were waiting for a telephone and the 2% were waiting for a dial tone. I believe, I believe, I, I hope I'm correct in uh, my, uh, my uh, quote, but uh, I believe it was Tony Lopez, <coughs> uh, who is now the publisher of Biz News Asia, who wrote an article and said that, you know, 98% of Filipinos are hoping for a telephone while 2% are waiting for a dial tone. And Lee Kuan Yew right. quoted that story. And I think it left tobacco chomping on his cigar, so to speak. Indeed, indeed. No, that, really, that was the thing. that uh, he, he had visions for the country that were conditioned by those kinds of observations. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, of course, when, again, when our friend Tony Lopez was quoted by Lee Kuan Yew, unfortunately, that quote became uh, you know, attributed to Lee Kuan Yew henceforth. But that was uh, talking about Lee Kuan Yew again. Uh, he, of course, was also quoted, rightly or wrongly, that the Philippines was suffering from too much democracy. And so mm. President Ramos sort of was stung by that. And he said, you know, he, he was determined to prove that democracy works and democracy is still the best thing. And so throughout his presidency, he was asserting this. And remember, uh, one of the things that he said was that democratization is really one of the important directions the country must go to. And so speaking of the letters I was talking about earlier, he was also known for his five Bs, no? democratization, decentralization, devolution, deregulation, and development that is sustainable or sustainable development. You know, he, he was always proclaiming these five Ds in many of his speeches. And mm -hmm. so that democratization was number one in his five Ds. And I think that was also because of the way that Lee Kuan Yew was supposedly saying publicly that I guess we were too democratic. And uh, clearly, clearly he didn't agree with that. W was he sensitive to criticism or... or well, I mean, not just criticism, but, you know, criticism that that bears truth. Was he very sensitive to this or was it because it was spoken by certain leaders, regional leaders or big people, uh, etc.? Uh, you're, you're saying whether he was sensitive to... No. Uh, does he? Did he react because it was a big shot or ah. a leader who was uh, making the criticism or or does he essentially react to criticism at large? Well, I think it's the latter. You know, it's, it doesn't matter who says it. He listens to the, you know, to the simplest and the poorest of our people. Mm -hmm. And, uh, well, I, I, I want to recall Mang Pandoy, for example, and, you know, how he became some sort of a celebrity because... Again, the, the needs of the Mang Pandois in our country were really the important uh, objective of the president, you know, to be able to make sure that everybody had their basic needs, uh, in fact, satisfied. During his presidency, we had a basic, a minimum basic needs program to make sure that, you know, in, in our different agencies of government, the minimum basic needs of every Filipino would be satisfied. And so when he heard criticisms, in the media, whether it was expressed by a state leader, by a world leader, or expressed by a common citizen, you know, he would take note. And that's why, you know, it was very, very common for us cabinet members to receive by 5 a.m. or, you know, the first thing we see on our desk every morning was already a faxed clipping of a news article wherein he had marginal instructions written already. And in fact, we, I think, 99 percent 95% of us cabinet members must have received 5 a.m. telephone calls from him. Usually, in reaction to a newspaper item he had read starting at 4 a.m. So this is because he was very sensitive to different kinds of criticisms. And, uh, you know, whatever is written in the media, whoever it's coming from, he would want to act on it right away. Or if not, if necessary, to explain it publicly right away. So, you know, I had my dose of those 5 a.m. calls and, you know, inflation was running, inflation was running high. 
and the, when the prob, there were problems with our rice prices and so on. And so, talagang ano yun, yung sensitivity niya to the public uh, welfare was really legendary. How would you label him or, as they say, characterize him? Kasi ako, sinasabi ko, karakter itong si FBR. Uh, I have had uh, encounters with him, uh, pleasant ones, no? very pleasant encounters where I would notice he's wearing eyeglasses that did not have lenses. I would say, sir, why are you wearing eyeglasses without lenses? Image, and bata, image. And, you know, the cigar, the, the unlit cigar. And, and you know, uh, I was wondering, this guy is, is, a, is, a, is an actor of sorts. Yeah. Uh, it was like a stage for him. He, but he was a nice guy, pleasant guy, but he was a character. H- how would you uh, label him? Well, that's, that's what made him so interesting. He, he, he was both firm and soft. That's the best way I can describe it. Mm-hmm. He was firm in his decision making, very decisive leader, and in fact, you know, uh, the, the, the kind of uh, CSW that he demanded demonstrated that firmness. But at the same time, he had a very soft side to it. First of all, he had a wonderful sense of humor, and sometimes his uh, in, when he exercised his sense of humor uh, in 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 foreign countries, for example, I remember an instance where you may remember how he was fond of pretending to throw out a prepared speech and he would actually throw it with a flourish so that all the papers scattered. And when he did that for the first time in China during the Boao Forum that he was part of the organizers of, our Chinese hosts were put off balance. They thought he was genuinely angry because <laughs> he threw uh, in the wind no? his, his mm-hmm. script for his speech. But that was you know, a very common uh, joke of his because he would say, oh, this speech prepared by Secretary Habito, I'll you can have it, but I'll just say what I want to say. But really, he was still, he had another copy on the podium that he was actually reading. <laughs> <laughs> but in any case, uh, that sense of humor and many, of course, many of his jokes we in his cabinet had heard over and over throughout his six years. But it was always eliciting a lot of laughter with every new audience. But, you know, the other soft spot that I like to remember and most fondly is, you know, I, I happen to be the youngest member of his cabinet. Mm-hmm. So I, my children were still very, very young. And literally, they would see me more on TV than physically. So I, might, I made a very gentle request with the president. Sir, we work seven days a week. Pwede po ba pag Sunday, I could bring my family along or some of my family along, which he actually agreed to. So there was one particular visit to Bataan. It was uh, the anniversary, the fall of Bataan Day, no? Mm-hmm. It was a Sunday, and you know uh, all the other cabinet members in the presidential yacht, and I had my whole family with me, down to our youngest, who was just, uh, just barely five years old at the time. And so, you know, it, it, it was some, it was some kind of a, uh, a license, a privilege I had as a young family, young uh, father with still very young children. But that showed the heart he had for for the young, uh, to the children especially. So I, I, I really admired him for that. I really loved the way that. He combined this softness with the firmness of the leadership that was demanded of a true statement that he was. What was he on a personal level with you? Because uh, we all hear about great leaders, great president, about surviving the great challenges. But, you know, it is in the private moments that we remember people. I, I remember that when my father passed away, I remember that FBR came on the first night of the wake and just before he left for Paris, he returned to the wake again uh, before leaving for flight. And and we were, a lot of people were surprised. There some even said, pare, mahal pala ni FBR tatay mo, biruin mo dalawang beses pang pumunta. And, and those are the things that are unexpected. What what about you? What are the personal moments that you remember? Well, you know, I remember him most for the time he actually came to our humble residence here in Los Baños. At the time that he had a visit elsewhere in the, in the town because of UP Los Baños and Erie and all that. And, you know, he, we had a very, very private moment with him. And, uh, but of course, it's actually my wife who was also very close to him. 
And he, in turn, really was uh, so close to my wife. He gave my wife a lot of inspiration. And uh, truly, uh, the, the family man in him showed, you know, in, in these interactions. We were telling him about our young children and about how we were all struggling in our family life because I was hardly seen at home and all that. And he was very, very sympathetic about that. So clearly, uh, he was a man. He, of course, he had his own family, all, of, all, all, all daughters, and of course, uh, he was the only male in his own family. So I think he understood the, the life of a family man. And so, as I said, uh, when, when he came to visit us at home and he saw our own uh, humble abode here, and he actually, he, you know, he, he actually was, uh, was very, very, uh, you, know, you know what? He actually went into the bedroom uh, of one of our children because you know, he wanted to have a very private meeting with us, that, uh, you know, with everybody else around him. He didn't want anybody to be listening to our personal conversation. But that was one of uh, several private conversations we had with him where you could really see the heart of the man. So we will really fondly remember him for having such a big heart. Uh, what about in terms of the presidency? I have, I've known a lot of presidents. I've met uh, and worked with some of the most powerful people in this country. And I've... I'd call it a privilege to see them in their moment of great burden. You know, the moment when parang, ano kaya, iwanan na lang natin to, moments, you know. Uh, when you were with the president, with Pre Fidel Valdez Ramos, was there ever a time when, when you saw the man more than the president lamenting his responsibility? Well, the, I think one of the most memorable times when there was uh, really a great burden on the presidency, was that time when uh, the, the execution of Flor Contemplacion, you know, this uh, Filipino uh, domestic who was executed in Singapore, when that happened, and we happened to be in a state visit of his in the UK, you know, in, in, in Britain. And uh, when we had to meet about it, he was truly in great anguish. And, uh, you know, we. We just didn't know what to do. He had tried the very, his very best to exercise uh, diplomacy with the Singapore government to, to lift that uh, death penalty. And unfortunately, in the end, uh, the, the execution happened. And so that clearly showed us a great burden to him. So, you know, it's times like this when the, the, what gives him the greatest burden is precisely even seeing a single Filipino citizen suffer that kind of a fate. So... Again, it was truly remarkable, the kind of heart he has for every Filipino. And so this is exactly what he was preaching to all of us. That's why his twin slogans were people empowerment with global competitiveness. In fact, those were the themes of the Philippine Development Plan. So that whenever he saw people suffering, he would actually be showing that same anguish in his very face. And we've witnessed that firsthand. Okay, well, uh, Professor Secretary Shalito Abito, thank you. Thank you very much for your time today. And thank you for sharing us or opening the small windows uh, that's, uh, that allows us to remember President Fidel Valdez Ramos. And uh, uh, we condole with you knowing, uh, we, knowing that you were close to him. And uh, we hope that uh, your memories will always uh, uh, keep you uh, firmly in the belief that this nation uh, will, will become an economic power the same way that uh, President Ramos viewed, uh, envisioned it to be. Thank you very much, Professor. Thank you. Thank you very much. And God bless President Ramos. Okay. God bless you as well, sir. Have a good day. And that's uh, Professor Shalito Abito, former NEDA secretary under the presidency of Fidel Valdez Ramos. And uh, we pray for the family. Uh, we're going to go for a quick break. And uh, when we return, we shift gears. Uh, we will be addressing uh, other concerns. And uh, needless to say, I'm sure we, uh, the other programs here on One News will continue to uh, uh, talk about uh, FVR in the coming days. Meanwhile, let's go for a break. We'll be right back here on Agenda.
Welcome back to the program agenda. I'm your host, Cito Beltran, thanking you for being subscribers of Signal TV, channels 8 and 250, uh, as well as those of you who try to catch us on Facebook and on YouTube. Okay, and uh, for the second part of our program today, we will be featuring the uh, problem brought to us by some viewers and people who have fallen victim to the uh, no, no, no contact apprehension schemes of cities such as Quezon City, Paranaque, etc., and which was also confirmed by uh, the head of the uh, engineering uh, bu this, uh, bureau of the MMDA uh, that several cities have uh, started uh, implementing regulations, traffic regulations, which are a bit harsh. Harsh because they charge 2,000 pesos for the first penalty, harsh because they are unclear, etc. And you know you have a problem when the public no longer goes to the authorities but to media, uh, particularly motoring media. In any case, let's uh, get on with the program. Let's introduce our guest for the second portion of Agenda, a regular here on Agenda. Uh, let's watch this video. Vernon Sarne is the founder and editor-in-chief of Visor. Sarne started his career in automotive journalism in 1995. He wrote for the motoring section of Philippine Daily Inquirer from 1998 to 2001 before launching a new car magazine named Rev, serving as its EIC from 2001 to 2003. Sarne also handled the motoring section of the Manila Times from 2003 to 2005, before moving to Top Gear Philippines in 2006. Okay, welcome to the program, Vernon, Editor-in-Chief of Visor. And pagpasensya mo na kung ilang taon na kung hindi sumusulat para sa'yo. <laughs> na busy, boss. Good morning, Paul. Okay, Vernon, uh, before anything, uh, please allow me to ask you certain questions on uh, on a recent event, recent life-changing event for you, uh, uh, not many people know that you actually had a stroke, two strokes to be exact. And one, the first one was what they would call a, you know, a reminder stroke. It was short, brief, you recovered. But the second one turned out to be uh, an almost goodbye moment for for you and for us. Would would you please uh, share that for uh, our viewers, please? Uh, Bali, sir, I had an aneurysm attack in 2000, uh, August 2000. And then 14 months later, I had a uh, stroke. Naman. Uh, buti na lang hindi siya connected, pero basically I had two life-threatening conditions uh, within a 14-month uh, period. Yeah, and, and the last one, that uh, the stroke, uh, they say, or you said, you were left uh, on the floor for eight hours, and kumbaga, Lord, kung kukunin mo ako, uh, what, what, could you tell us? Ano kasi, sir, uh, I'm... Ayaw kasi ano sir ayaw kong ayaw kong tumawag ng doktor uh, sabi nga nila pagsaway ano so i i did not bother any any of my friends relatives and i just uh, i just waited sa sa condo ko basically just telling the lord that you know, if if that was his time for me to go, uh, and I was I was okay with it. Pero apparently nga, after eight hours, uh, the Lord made it clear to me na hindi ko pa time talaga. Um, so after after eight hours, uh, 
people somehow found me in my condo, in mga mga writers ko, in mga some some friends, and they for some reason they were able to rush me sa sa, sa hospital po. Okay, and uh, ever since that time, nagbago na rin ang buhay mo, living, uh, well, you were always healthy. I think uh, the reason I'm bringing this up, ladies and gentlemen, uh, it, this is a surprise topic kasi Vernon was invited to talk about the traffic uh, it, uh, essentially, but I, I took this opportunity because Vernon Sarne is probably, was probably one of the most uh, hardest working motoring journalist and the uh, editor in the country. And he gave all of his life, his passion, his energy to his work. And uh, until one day, the Lord used what many people would have considered a, a, a unfortunate uh, incident to turn him around and say, Bernon, Marami kang gagawin, huwag kang magpa, huwag kang nagmamadaling mapunta sa hukay. So we're happy to see you, Vernon. And uh, clearly, you are blessed. You're back at work. Uh, uh, friends are all uh, all over so, uh, praying for you. But uh, may, mukhang nagbago. Things seems to have changed for Visor. Because uh, in the past, Visor has just been a motoring, uh, online motoring magazine of sorts. But now, ito eh, tinawag ng, kay, ng ating uh, executive producer, sumbungan ng bayan. Okay, uh, Visor has become the, the motoring sumbungan ng bayan. Could you just share with us by, uh, what are the many or the different things na uh, are being reported to you or sinusumbong ng bayan sa Visor? Uh, well, sir, yung mga, mga sirang... Kali eh, yung mga uh, road infrastructure na na napapabayaan ng gobyerno. Uh, yung mga reckless motorists, mga motorcycle riders, mga car drivers na uh, dangerous sa paggamit ng kalsada. And of course, itong tung topic natin ngayon, itong no, yung NCAP, no, no apprehension, no contact apprehension program. Uh, I, I think that's the most that's the hottest topic now in uh, in motoring. Okay, and uh, I'm sure you and your writers have analyzed it. Uh, I was trying to analyze one particular uh, post of Visor where your reader complain, complainant was pointing out somewhere I Rodriguez Bayon in Quezon City, where there is an intersection and a right turn. Pero merong nilagay na plastic barrier. Uh, could you explain to us what's going on there? I think one of the problems is that uh, nagkakaroon ng problema sa pag-review ng mga, uh, yung mga tao na nagmaman ng uh, NCAP uh, videos. Mm -hmm. Because uh, sabi ng mga motorist, Maybe hindi hindi drivers yung mga <clears throat> yung mga evaluate yung mga reviewers kasi hindi na naiintindihan yung dinadaanan ng mga motorista. Mm -hmm. For instance ngayon nga yung yung uh, dapat ng kakanan tapos sa uh, inexpect ng mga end cap uh, reviewers na dapat adun uh, sa pinaka gilid. Ang problema hindi mo magagawa to because sobrang masikip yung right side dahil yeah. may merong usually may barrier na nilalagay doon so basically hindi, hindi ka pwedeng dumaan sa sa rightmost lane without basically running over the the line yeah because normally if you're going to do a right turn you should be on the correct lane yes. uh, at least 50 to 20, 20 to 50 meters before the turn yeah. But in the video that we are now showing, ladies and gentlemen, you will notice that that orange plastic barrier or lane divider was uh, placed too much into the right na hindi magkakasya ang kotse. Pang motor lang talaga ang dadaan doon. Yeah, ang, ang, 
ang uh, suggestion ko nga sir dapat yung uh, mga nag, yung mga nag uh, review talaga nung uh, end cap uh, videos dapat sila mismo dapat driver sila eh, car driver sila ang problema mm-hmm. baka wala sila experience sa pagmamaneho ng ng kotse baka maybe baka bisikleta o motor lang uh, inooperate nila o keyboard o kaya keyboard so, keyboard expert parang ganun so dapat ang suggestion ko sa NCAP dapat you know, dapat may merong uh, merong malaking pangunawa pagunawa yung mga yung mga reviewers dun sa kinakaharap nung driver mm-hmm. No, in fact, uh, what about road? Uh, you know about education or public information? Because uh, napansin ko rin, maraming ginawang ganyan na no contact apprehension lanes. Uh, you know, if you drive on EDSA, yung uh, bus carousel, uh, some people will tell you, "Kuya, you should go enter the bus carousel." Sabi ko, "Are you illiterate? They can't you read the sign? It says." bus only but then when you're in uh, meetings or conversations they tell you oh certain sections you're allowed to go into that lane so kumbaga uh, what we have now is a very confusing environment uh, you're an editor in chief uh, for the motoring beat ano bang napapag-usapan regarding that kasi parang uh, babaguhin yung lane hindi naman pinipin kino-cover yung dating lane etc yeah ang dapat kasi uh, sir yung uh, yung mga nagpapatupad ng batas natin sa daan dapat consistent sila eh. Mm-hmm. Dapat kung ano yung pinapatupad sa halimbawa sa sa Makati, dapat ganoon din ang pinapatupad sa Pasig, sa sa Quezon City, sa EDSA ng MMDA. Ano nangyari? Ano pa pansin ko sir based sa mga sa experience ko rin nung drive pa ako at saka ng mga complaints ng mga readers namin. Uh, Parang iba-iba yung 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 pag-implement nung nung uh, batas. Parang kanya-kanyang para kanya-kanyang territories, kunya rin mm-hmm. MMDA yung mag-execute ibang ibang paraan nila na pag-execute ng uh, nung uh, batas. Iba rin sa Manila, iba rin sa Paranaque. Parang naguguluhan ang, ang mga motorista natin. Dapat may consistency. Yeah. Uh, w- one complaint I received on Facebook uh, in particular was that uh, in Paranaque, eh, well, they don't send you a letter because uh, in the US, in Europe, pag na-camera ka, they will check your registration and send you a ticket via mail or at least a notice that you have been uh, caught in violation of this traffic rule and you have to pay the fine. And in the Philippines, you will only find out that you have had uh, certain uh, uh, arrests or were, were caught uh, only after, only when you register the car. Kumbaga, sabi nga nung ating uh, message, message, nag-message, eh baka ilan daang libo na yung utang ko hindi ko pa alam. There is no Sir, sir recently may may sumulat sa amin na uh, a, a few a couple of weeks ago uh, na discover niya nung as early as nung May, marami na pala siyang uh, violation, hindi na natatanggap. So pin, sabay-sabay pinadala sa kanya nung I think that was was it Manila or Valenzuela? Uh, mm-hmm. Doon niya lang na-discover na meron na siyang sampung vali- va- violation ng May and uh, yung, yung utang niya ay amounting to 40, almost 40,000. So par- parang saan kukunin ng motor- motorista yung ganung amount? Hindi niya alam na naipon na pala yung mga violations niya. And hindi man lang niya alam na may violation siya. Exactly. So uh, you're driving, you think you are driving correctly only to find out that according to the city authorities, eh, that is not acceptable in their city. Yeah. So, hey, uh, yeah. yun po ang pinag, pinaglalaban ngayon ng mga... Al- alam niyo ba sir, merong uh, mga ganap na protesta at 9.45 sa UP, sa University Hotel. 
Ito yung uh, stop and cap uh, coalition daw. Uh, made up of uh, mga transport groups. Mm-hmm. Kasi nga, uh, gusto nilang i-protest yung nangyayari ngayon sa NCAP because uh, silang mga eto mga public utility vehicle operators po sobrang sobrang inconvenient yung nag- na, na, nangyayari sa kanila uh, basically hindi sila makapag-renew ng mga uh, kanilang sasakyan dahil meron silang pending na, na mga NCAP cases na hindi din rin nila ma, ma- settle because How can you say that isang operator meron na siyang 70,000 pesos na na penalty? I mean, mm-hmm. parang nahihirapan silang sumunod dun sa sa pinapatupad ng uh, NCAP. So what is what was intend what is intended to be an efficient means for law enforcement is turning out to be a financial injustice to Parang, parang nangyayari sa parang ano, sabi ng mga tao, parang naging money-making venture eh. Mm-hmm. Halimbawa, sabi ng mga readers namin, most of them, they say na yung traffic light daw, pinapatay na yung mga timer, yung mga timer sa, mm-hmm. sa traffic light. Dati, they found that uh, timer to be really useful. Ngayon, nakapatay na siya. Parang, parang the thing is that Naging entrapment yung yung uh, stoplight. Yeah, yung ma- malagay lang yung bumper mo sa may ibabaw ng pedestrian lane or doon sa yellow box, bumper lang, eh may ticket ka na. Yeah. So, bisan tatanungin mo sarili mo, no? ano ba talaga ang purpose nitong NCAP? To manage our traffic or to make sure na lahat mag- magbayad tayo no? for... for So is it ito ba talaga para ayusin ang ating uh, traffic situation or baka pag-raise ng ng pera? Parang parang na, okay. na, naguguluhan ako kung anong ano talaga ang purpose nito. Yung sinasabi po nating NCAP ay hindi po ito military ano. This is the no contact okay. apprehension policy of local government units. Now, uh, may iba pa bang mga areas of concern o subject matter na isinusumbong din sa inyo, Vernon? No, I, let me just clarify that, sir. Uh, I'm for, I'm all for NCAP, sa totoo lang. In fact, gusto ko yung, gusto, rin, gusto ko rin yung nangyayari ngayon na takot yung mga motorista na mag-commit ng mm-hmm. ng maling Uh, galaw sa kalsada. Ang problema, parang dapat mamanap tayo ng balance, ng balance. Hindi, hindi puro huli. In fact, because of NCAP, I think, yung mga motorista ngayon ay nag-display na sila ng mga illegitimate na plaka because mm-hmm. ayaw nilang mahuli sa camera. Um, Marami, marami ka makakasabahan makakasabay sa sa kalye na walang walang plaka na may minsan tinatakpan pa yung yung plaka nila. So parang mm-hmm. naging naging anarchy no sa sa kalsada natin, wag lang sila mahuli. Kumbaga niloloko niyo na kami, lolokohin din namin parang, kayo. Parang ganoon eh. Parang ganoon. So when does this end? So I suppose kailangan kailangan ma-assure yung mga motorista na tama yung pagpapatupad pagpapatupad nung uh, NCAP. Okay, yung sinabi mong protest uh, diyan sa University of the hotel. Philippines, yeah, University Hotel sa sa loob ng uh, UP Diliman. Okay, kailan 'yon? Ngayon po, uh, mamaya 9 9:45 po, 9:45. Okay, and uh, it will be uh, among sa uh, transport operators largely or pati yung private sector motorists. Uh, ang sabi sa akin nung nagpadala ng invita- invitation sa amin is uh, kasama na rin daw yung mga private eh. Aha. Uh-huh. And yung bang papakita, papakita, papakita daw nila yung mga naipon nila mga notification. Mm-hmm. Uh, na hindi nila kaya tal- di talaga nila kaya ma-settle. Ay yung bang mga iba-ibang mga motoring journalist na doon ba sila? I, I well I don't know po kung na naimbitahan sila nung grupo na to. Ito po yung yung grupo na to contacted us nung nung Sabado lang po. 
Yeah, well, I hope uh, we can uh, put the word out and uh, timbrihan mo na rin yung mga tropa natin, Bernon, because this is a public concern when uh, the law is being manipulated and it becomes income generation and not law enforcement. Anyway, Vernon, thank you very much for uh, staying the course, for uh, staying alive. Ika nga, patugtog mo na yung BGs natin dyan sa background and stay healthy. God bless you, brother. Thank you. Okay, that's Vernon Sarne, Editor-in-Chief of Viser Magazine, uh, online magazine. And, uh, well, we've reached the uh, end of the program. Let's now go for our blessing for the week. And here we go. Paki-post nga. Uh, okay, there we go. It is from the Book of Psalms, chapter 20, verse 4. May God give you the desire of your heart and make your plans succeed. That is our prayer of blessings upon all of you. And please keep it here on One News PH.